Hello, my name is Dr. Alex Carter. I'm going to talk to you briefly about the ethics of AI. The lecture is going to cover a range of different issues and I will move through these fairly quickly. Uh, if at any point you are struggling with uh, understanding what I'm talking about, it might be best to pause and replay that section. Um, I will start by looking at the theoretical uh, framework which I have established for talking about ethics in AI. Um, this will be disclosed then through a series of practical problems and what I will call non-problems, i.e. problems that aren't really problems once you start thinking about them or once you apply the, the theoretical approach I'm talking about. So let me begin by looking at that theoretical approach. So firstly, the most common failure that I often find when people talk about artificial intelligence in general, not just with, with regards to ethics, but with regards to anything to do with AI, is that we fail to understand what, how we think, how we as human beings are thinking and how we understand the world. Um, crucially, and this is the, the tagline which might continue on through this lecture, is that machines don't think like us, they think like we think we think. Now that's an important thing to realize because once we realize that we're thinking about thinking and that we've built this into machines and now we're trying to analyze it, it really helps us to understand where we go wrong and why we make the mistakes that we make. So the first thing to realize, I will argue, is that we are fundamentally different from the machines that we are designing. And I will only look at this briefly, so um, it's worth thinking about this yourselves as well once, once the lecture is over. But let me begin by just introducing some aspects of what I'm talking about. So Marvin Minsky, a uh, famous uh, AI theorist um, and, and practitioner in AI, uh, once made the claim that we are only machines made of meat, i.e. that human beings are machines like any other machine. We have moving parts and we are purely physical. I do not dispute any of that, by the way. Um, but we could argue, as John Searle and others might, might have done in the past, that the meat matters. <laughs> yeah, the fact that we're made of meat matters. We so far have not built on organic AI, although this has been talked about in, in recent science fiction shows as, as the next stage of evolution, in at least the thinking around AI, is that we could create machines made of meat. Now, that is uh, a long way off, I suspect, but it, it does at least show that there is a possibility that at some point the gap will close between ourselves and machines. And I don't dispute this. I don't want to be accused of having what Daniel Dennett would call a lack of imagination. But I am interested in what Daniel Dennett says um, in his books where he talks about the fact that Darwin and Turing were onto the same thing, what he calls competence without comprehension. And this perhaps is a much deeper philosophical distinction to draw between machines and ourselves. Namely that machines are competent, but we have comprehension. But isn't Daniel Dennett saying that Darwin and Turing were onto the same thing, i.e. that we have evolved to be competent? And that's true, we have, and we've evolved through a system of comprehension. And this is why it's important to realise that the parallel that is being drawn here is not between human beings and machines, it's between evolution and computation. That's an important thing to realize. The process of evolution is comparable to the process of computation. Those two processes have given rise to competence, i.e. nature is competent, just as a computer is competent. But we have comprehension, which machines as yet do not. And this is an important point to realize. And I just want to pause briefly to look at uh, two quotes from two great luminary figures in this field. Um, the late Stephen Hawking, who said, the real risk with AI isn't malice, but competence. There you go, talking about competence again. A super intelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing, accomplishing its goals. And if those goals aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. Now, Stephen Hawking also once, seriously, once said that we, were, we should be seriously worried about AI. And I think partly what was driving that was the fact that he relied so heavily on AI to say the things he wanted to say. The AI would often suggest three or four things that he might say, and he would pick the one he wanted to say, which meant that it had a lot of control over what he was doing. And in a way, that's what he's talking about here, is that competence will replace our comprehension. So that we will AI ourselves, we will make ourselves comparable with machines, not by bringing them up to our level, but reducing us to their level. So that's one thing that, that arguably is only implicit in what he's talking about here. The other thing he's talking about here is that a competent machine might have different aims and goals than a comprehending animal. 
and that's something else we need to we should be thinking about again this is very broad brush strokes and um, and should just frame our thinking when we come to talk about AI and um, and ethics the other quote I'd like to look at is from Daniel Dennett again who says all we're going to see in our own lifetimes are intelligent tools not colleagues don't think of them as colleagues don't try to make them colleagues and above all don't kid yourself that they're colleagues now this is fundamentally important when we're talking about AI in business is that AI has started to sort of, um, become a sense in which we are relying upon them in the way that we might rely upon a colleague. I don't think we're there yet, but there is a danger, and I think Daniel Dennett's very close to this and is very aware that we're very close to taking that step to seeing them not as tools, but as colleagues. And that's again another ethical thing we need to think about, a social, economic and, and ethical consideration that we need to bear in mind as we come to think about AI. So one of the, the sort of broader questions we can ask around ethics is what is it, what is ethics all about? What is it made up of? And this is when we, we what we would describe as meta-ethics. Now I'm not going to go into great detail about meta-ethics. What I am going to talk about is certain meta-ethical assumptions that have been made in the designing of AI to date. So for instance, um, one of the things we want from AI is that it is quantifiable. And we want this because we want the machines we program to be transparent and predictable. But that assumes certain things about the theoretical viewpoint which we're taking with regards to AI. The first is that it assumes that machines can be responsible, that it's the machines who are the colleagues, not the tools. Again, this is why I bring, bring this sort of question around comprehension and around competence to bear. They are competent tools. They are not comprehending colleagues. The second, it assumes that cognitivism is true. Now this needs a little bit of explanation. Cognitivists hold that moral statements are either true or false. So they are, they're not saying that moral statements are true, they're not making that kind of claim, they're not trying to say which kinds of claims are true. This is why it's meta-ethics. They're not saying it's true that we should always bring about the best consequences or that um, intentions matter. They're not making those kinds of claims. What they're claiming is, if you hold that any of those statements might be true or false, then you are a cognitivist. Now this is opposed to non-cognitivism, which argues that statements are neither true nor false. So for instance, you mustn't hit her might be compared with two plus two must equal four. In both, ca both cases, you've got must, or you, you must not hit her versus you must, um, two plus two must equal four. In the same situation, you've got a kind of magical must that has a hardness to it, a kind of force to it. And you might say, well, in the same way that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true, you, mu you mustn't hit her could also be true, or not hitting her might be a true statement. Or we might take it more like the non-cognitivists and say that it's a command. You mustn't hit her means don't hit her, just as I might say, shut the door. Now, shut the door isn't either true or false. The door might already be shut, and I might say, shut the door, and you might say, I don't know what you mean. But you wouldn't say false. So again, it's this question around does truth and falsity apply in ethical consideration? Now you might see why that might have a bearing on machines, because of course machines require a true-false output. They need to be able to say if some, some, and such, some and so situation is true or it's false, and what this means for the ethics. But even more deeply than this, the the theoretical position required for creating machines that can act ethically also assumes a certain kind of cognitivism, namely a cognitivism which allows for true statements. Now just to be very clear here, I've talked about cognitivism as allowing for both truth or falsity, but there is one cognitivist theory, and this is cognitivist, which states that they are true or false, they are all false. And this is J.L. Mackey's error theory. He argues that all moral statements are false and that we can know that they're false. He delivers two arguments for this. The first one is that um, moral statements are relative, meaning that you can always force a moral statement down to relativity. I mean, you can never completely settle disagreement between parties, which means that there is no truth in the way that you might say it is sunny today or it is not raining. 
Right? You might make a claim it is not raining, and two people might disagree about that because they're in different places, and that settles the disagreement. But you can't quite do that with moral statements, or at least Mackey argues this. He also argues that, uh, from the argument of queerness, which is that anything that would settle this disagreement is so alien to our understanding. We have no understanding of what it is, meaning the fact that we can disagree, the fact that I can reach a different conclusion about what's moral from what from the decision that you reach about what's moral, implies that what we're using to determine that is not a naturally innate capacity to just spot moral truth. So the point is, even if there were truths, and he's arguing that there are truths, namely, there are the, the truth that they're all false. Um, this is the only thing that we can use to determine that, is looking and saying, well, look, all these, all these people disagree. The fact that they disagree implies that they don't have a certain intuition, which means that the intuition uh, would have to be about something rather strange. And to drive that point home about the problem of queerness, here's, here's the issue we've got. If I were to say, um, so, such and such an action is wrong, to settle that disagreement, I would have to deliver something to you which you don't already know. And yet you might already know that what I'm talking about is wrong. And this is, this is the problem. How can something so familiar as what's right and wrong be settled by something so unfamiliar as an idea we are yet to discover? So that's the problem that, he, that Mackey's driving home. In any case, that's not overly important. What's important is that theory, which is a cognitivist theory, could not be programmed into a moral machine. You could not come up with an algorithm which was itself ethical without um, having settled this, this issue and removed the possibility that all moral statements are false. And much more importantly, this approach is completely inconsistent with certain approaches that are currently being taken to developing ethical AI. And I'm going to give you a few examples here. So this is the first example I want to offer of a non-problem in ethical AI. So MIT recently conducted some research into driverless cars and how they could resolve ethical dilemmas. The sorts of ethical dilemmas we have in mind are where you either let the car drive into three pedestrians or you have it drive into an obstacle. Um, so either the people on foot or the people in the car are the ones injured or killed. Now this is, uh, they used variations of what um, is called the trolley problem, which Philip Foote came up with, um, I, I, think, I think now in the 70s. Um, and the, the old trolley problem was one you might be familiar with, whereby a, a trolley, a, a tram, is heading down some tracks and you are able to pull the, 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 um, the lever to put it onto a different track. On that other track is one person, but this will at least save the five people who are on the other track. So you've got a choice between killing one person or letting five people die. And how do you face this problem? Now, the reason I think this is a, a non-problem is because no human being, as far as I'm aware, has ever faced that problem. Nor has any human being solved that problem using the philosophical analysis required to get a correct answer. What I mean is, we have judged people to be right or wrong, not on the basis of how they solved the trolley problem, but upon what they did in the moment. And this is important, and I don't need to go into this in great detail. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to go into why I think that this is a mistake in that we are overthinking the problem of turning it into this, this non-problem by thinking, well, how should we act or how should we have acted in this particular situation rather than simply, how did we act? Because my point is this, we do right now hold people responsible for the actions they perform without going through this kind of thinking. So my question becomes, why would we apply this kind of thinking to artificial decisions or judgments? Why should an AI, which we are trying to get to think like us, think completely alien in a completely alien way to the way in which we currently think? So that's, that's just a very broad objection that I have to this kind of approach, whereby we ask questions based upon ethical theories that we do not yet ourselves implement in our decision making. There are other non-problems which we will face. So for instance, there are non-problems which we encounter when we're dealing with new technology, but familiar situations. So there are situations that are not new, which, which are in involve AI, but which already have answers. So for instance, the use of drones in people's backyards, and we would 
talk about this and say that this is a problem because it involves intruding into people's privacy. Um, but we already have laws against uh, intruding into people's privacy, whether it's done by a drone or by a telescope or by hiding in some bushes, we already have rules and laws against this kind of action. So that's not really a case where new technology is causing new problems. However, the, the sword cuts both ways. We've got an equally problematic side, which is that common features can mislead us into thinking that we've got similar situations. So drones are air aircraft, but really don't obey existing air traffic laws. Most air traffic laws, of course, being established with a, an individual at the helm, or at least a pilot who is able to take over from a machine and fly the plane. So we have this kind of issue, and there are examples that are already existing in the law. So, for instance, segways and skateboards were not thought of when many of the... Um, the public spaces in, in the United States were set up. And so questions were raised about whether the ban on vehicles accessing the park should apply to segways. Now this is a kind of, again, it's simply, there are some ways in which this becomes a non-problem because you could just simply say, well, they weren't thought about, so that's not relevant, or if they weren't thought about, so this is completely new and therefore we can come up with new laws about it. Um, but the point is, we get into these kinds of disputes because the law doesn't operate in this kind of way. It doesn't it? Doesn't it tries to incorporate into precedent what is potentially entirely new? So I think some of the problems that we, some of the non-problems we're facing, can be resolved um, with two simple steps. Um, actually, I don't think they're simple at all. I think they're, they're, they are easy to put, very difficult to put into practice, but we'll see some examples of this in a moment. But firstly, we should resist the temptation to understand thinking by thinking about it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't think of thought as, as a relevant way of, of grappling with these ideas, but the problem is once you introduce thinking about thinking, you suddenly have created an extra level of complexity that may not exist in the action itself. So instead, another perfectly acceptable methodology I would suggest is to simply look at how we currently make use of concepts and ideas. So it's perfectly reasonable to have this kind of forward thinking approach and try and um, sophisticate our methods, but at the same time, don't forget the kind of naive, naive approaches, which are often the best approaches, which are simply how we would normally do things in an everyday setting. So this is more about, this is less about the, the empiricist versus rationalist debate, i.e. should we look um, through observation or should we use our, th our thought processes to try and come up with a solution. It's more a reflection that, human, that for humans, um, thinking is only one type of action. But this is a problem because this is not true of AI. Thinking is not one type of action for an AI. Thinking is the only type of action for an AI. And this brings me to my second point. We have to accept that AI is a manifestation of our thinking. It is not a manifestation of some um, non-human process of thinking, nor is it a manifestation of action, um, unless it is our action through thought. So as I said, thinking is a kind of action that we can perform. Now we can perform that in our own heads, or we can perform it with a calculator, or we can perform it using an AI. And that's probably the safer way in which we need to be thinking about this, simply because it, sees, it stops us putting the ethics into the machine. I've explained why cognitivism is a problem, and my reason for doing that was to explain why we can't just program into a computer an ethics which we hold already as self-evident. We do not have a self-evident ethics to program into a machine. And uh, according to Mackie, we never will. And according to non-cognitivists, we never could. Okay. So one way in which this comes out quite forcibly is when we talk about black box computers. So a very common problem we have with black box computers, so machine learning um, AI, is that when it's made the decision, we want to understand that decision. This again goes back to my point about we want transparency and predictability. So we need to be able to understand the outcome of a machine learning decision. But due to their complexity, these decisions are not open to analysis by us. 
So where we have a machine where we put some inputs in and we get some outputs out, the process in the middle is inscrutable to us. We do not know how to open that box to get perfect answers out again as to understand why the, the machine did what it did. Now, there are ingenious solutions to this. There have been uh, methods proposed um, uh, by various different people on explainable AI or XAI, which would use, for instance, counterfactuals to identify the decisive factors. So for instance, if you've got an AI that's determining who should get a loan, you could put into the inputs different variables. So you could say, if we lowered the income um, of the person, would the loan be accepted? If we raised the income above it, uh, higher, would that mean that it would be accepted? And so on and so on. And through that kind of true-false methodology, the, the counterfactual methodology, you can deliver an understanding of what is going on inside that black box. So counterfactuals do provide a targeted approach that might help to overcome some of these well-known issues, such as bias, and of course this is where the ethics comes in. We want to understand why a machine made the decision because we want to understand perhaps why certain members of society are being disadvantaged over other members of society. Why, for instance, black people are not getting loans approved just when white people are, or why women aren't getting loans approved um, when, when men are. So we have these biases built into the system or what, what appears to be biases built into the system. So we want to understand, is that part of the machine or is it part of the, the world that it's, it's trying to reflect imperfectly? But the problem with using counterfactuals is that you have to do this work yourself. We are now, or, or perhaps develop an algorithm to be a, a check on the other algorithm. But the problem with doing that is that that still requires us to know what we're looking for. We still have to know what we're talking about when we're talking about the bias. Now, there are plenty of examples, and you can just trawl the internet for these, but there are plenty of examples of situations in which companies were developing algorithms without understanding what was going into them. Um, I think a famous example was Facebook uh, using their facial recognition system and they trained it on all the faces within their company. And they have a big company, so they have many faces, but those faces represent a bias, namely people who end up working in the tech industry in the United States. So there were lots of white and Asian faces, very few black faces, and so the um, algorithm was much worse at recognizing black faces. And we had all sorts of issues surrounding that, but there are other examples in um, when machine learning has been used to de determine um, punishments for criminals, recidivism is, a, is one of the main determining factors. But uh, recidivism might be determined by postcode. So the postcodes go into the machine, it says you live in a certain neighborhood, that neighborhood perhaps has a, a particular history of crime and that's associated with perhaps a, a history of race as well. And that history comes out in the machine in its own bias towards people from a particular postcode. So there are all sorts of ways in which implicit bias um, gets worked into the machine. Now, there is also the issue, and this is a secondary problem with using counterfactuals, in that what programmers might try and do is correct for each individual bias simply by gaming the system such that the AI is not making what we would call a good decision, it's making a safe decision within the parameters, the rules of that particular game. Now this contravenes Goodhart's law, which states, whether you agree with it or not, but Goodhart's law states that um, a measure, once it's become a target, ceases to be a good measure. So, for instance, certain colleges in Cambridge were finding that students from particular postcodes were not, or zip codes, were not attending the colleges. Um, now, a very poor response to that would be then to say, well, what we'll do is we'll do um, a random selection of postcodes, ignore what the, the students are capable of, ignore their, their abilities and, and, and other, other factors, and just focus on their postcodes, or at least we'll factor in their postcodes to the decision. But the problem is that just games the system. It doesn't fix the underlying problem. The underlying problem was that the decision process that was being used by humans in this case is one where um, they are prejudicing against certain people without even being aware of it. So what the question they should have been asking is, how can we come up with a different process of deciding who is suitable to attend our college? One that doesn't say, 
you're more intelligent if you come from different places in the country, which is clearly not valid. It doesn't seem to be true that that would be universally the case, that it, your intelligence is determined by your location of where you live, not even where you were born. Okay. So another solution to this particular black, pro the black box problem is to have human beings assess the outcomes, and these are what are called hybrid decisions. Now, hybrid decisions are being used in some very sensitive areas in law and in healthcare. In fact, Google's DeepMind is currently trying to stem the spread of COVID-19. And one of the things they've done to make this a speedier process is to end hybrid decision making. So human beings stop checking the results from the machine learning. Now, this raises some questions for me by itself. If that hybrid decision process was implemented for ethical reasons, why would we decide to suspend it in a situation which everyone agrees is serious? Doesn't the, the seriousness of the situation mean that the ethics should be there um, guiding our decisions rather than saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's not an important process, we can drop it. If it's not an important process, why do we do it? And this brings me to this, the horns of a dilemma. Hybrid decisions, um, mistakes in hybrid decisions are necessarily rare because if errors are common, then why are we using machine learning in the first place? And if no errors occur, then what are we checking? What is the human being checking? And this is a common question that gets raised when it comes to hybrid decisions. What is the human being checking? Are they checking to see that it's right or that it's wrong? Are they simply checking to see whether or not um, it looks okay, that the, the result isn't absolutely absurd? I'll give you one example of, of this. So um, tax law in Australia was such that the decisions were made by an algorithm about how much tax someone needed to pay. Someone got a letter saying you need to pay X amount of money. They paid it. They then did their own calculations and realised this was wrong. Arguably, that's a hybrid decision. The, the, the person paying the tax realised it was wrong. Um, but this was also discovered by the civil service. Now, the person paying the tax realised it was wrong, but was fine with it because he paid less. The civil service were less happy because they, they realised that he was paying less tax than he should have been. So they sent him another letter saying, you need to pay this extra tax, to which he responded, no, I've had my tax decision and uh, it's in this letter and, and I, I, I obeyed it. Um, so three judges were called in to make a decision. The first two said that no decision had been made because no human being had been involved. The third judge took a functionalist approach, a non-cognitivist approach, I hasten to add, um, whereby he said the letter was the decision. Now this did actually persuade the other two judges and I believe they decided in favour of the uh, taxpayer. But the issue that was raised is a deep one. It's a deeply problematic one because if the, the hybrid decisions are there to check mistakes that are being made by the machine, then um, the decision hasn't yet been made until the human being gets involved. So it's not checking, it's part of the decision process. But that seems laborious because there's surely going to be some cases where there's no human involvement, i.e. they just look and they, they say that's fine and they pass it through. So what do we want a hybrid decision to be? Do we want it to be where the computer makes half the decision and we finalise the decision? Or do we want it to be an oversight issue? But if it's an oversight issue, when it's not, a, it's not a hybrid decision of any meaningful sense. Okay. Now, what I suggest, as I was talking about before, is that some of the difficulties we're getting into here are due to the fact that we're confusing competence with comprehension. Now, when I say that, I don't mean competence is a bad thing or that comprehension is a bad thing. What I mean is they're just two different things. So, for instance, we might say, and it's perfectly um, common to hear this retort, but aren't human beings black boxes? If I ask you your reasons and you give them to me, I don't know, A, whether you know that that's your reason. Right? So I might give a reason in all honesty, but I might not realise that I'm giving the wrong answer. The right answer might be there was a, a process going on in my brain that I wasn't aware of and it delivered this answer. So my decisions are, in some sense, even a black box to myself. But I argue that human beings are not black boxes. What we are is black and white boxes, insofar as there is computation going on, and in that computation sense, we're black boxes. We do not yet have a scientific explanation for how human beings make decisions, for how the brain works fundamentally, and how that delivers in 
common sense everyday terms the decisions that we deliver. We can have reflex actions and we can understand how those reflexes happen. We can understand perhaps simple things like um, if you think of a chair, what happens within your brain and we can then predict on the basis of that. But we can't yet know what it means to say, love your pet or um, realize you need more milk. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't translate from the black into the white picture. And so that's the, the point I'm making is that the white box is the everyday explanations that we offer, which are incorrigible, which is why I call them white boxes, because they're perfectly clear. They're so clear, we can't even question them. If someone said, um, I went to the shops because I was out of milk, no one can say, well, that's not true. You're lying, unless they have some sort of evidence for this. I mean, the reason I say honestly is because we have to take as a, as a general trend that people are genu generally honest. If they weren't, then we would have no such concept of honesty. But if I say honestly, I did X because of Y, there's no way in which someone can say, no, you didn't. For the same reason that if I went to a dentist and said, I have a toothache, the dentist can't say, I don't think you do. I would just go to another dentist. Right? So in some senses, we are black boxes because the dentist might be talking about the scientific explanation so you don't really have a pain, you just think you have a pain or you're, you've got a scheme going on or something like that, but whatever. The black box is closed to us, but it's also, funnily enough, closed to the dentist, which is why that doesn't happen. The white box is open to us both. I can give you my reasons and you can know my reasons. Okay, so there are fundamental differences and what we might try and do therefore is try and create a white box within uh, outside of a black box and the, the counterfactual system and other systems have been, are being designed around that idea but the problem they have is that these are fundamentally different and opposing concepts the operations of competence and of comprehension are fundamentally separate comprehension relies upon competence I couldn't be a comprehending human being if evolution hadn't taken place or if the scientific processes that are going on in my brain weren't taking place but at the same time that process is not the same thing, um, or the, out, the, the comprehension is not the same thing as the process itself. So you could, a, a neuroscientist could explain to me what's going on in my brain and I wouldn't have a clue what they were talking about, although of course I would know exactly what they were talking about because I know what's going on in my brain, or at least in my mind. Okay, so these are deep problems that are not going to be resolved quickly or easily. Um, but they do point to where the, I, I can at least point to where the mistakes are, are taking place. But this way also, the fact that we, we desire comprehension over competence in some cases might explain why we're more willing to trust decisions made by a person over even objectively more reliable decisions delivered by machine learning or AI. So if an, an AI were to instruct us to invest in, in a certain company, um, and a human being were to advise us to invest in a different company, we will be liable to trust the person more, even if we know fully, eyes open, that the AI is right 88% of the time and the advisor is right 75% of the time. So there are deep issues around what's going on here, um, but I, my, my suggestion is that partly what's happening is that we are associating with the wrong processes that are going on. We, we, we're pointing to the wrong operators. We are, what we are desiring when we trust a person over an AI is comprehension. We want to know that the person understands that the advice they're giving is quantifiable and qualifiable and that it comes with certain consequences for the individual they're giving it to. The AI has no such um, wider picture, no such comprehension around what's actually involved. So this is why it's problematic to speak of trust, but I have a solution for that too. Or at least uh, today and Floridi have offered uh, a, a solution to this. They talk about e-trust. They say when e-trust is considered from a philosophical perspective, four problems are salient. One, the fundamental and dist distinctive aspects of e-trust. Two, whether e-trust should be considered as an occurrence of trust online or as an independent phenomenon in itself. Three, whether the environment of occurrence has any influence on the emergence of e-trust. And four, the extent to which in artificial agents can be involved in an e-trust relationship. Now this is important because what they're talking about here seems to rely upon the theoretical framework I've been talking about. That there is, um, uh, on point two, uh, grounds for separating out 
trust online from it, from uh, trust as an independent phenomenon. And we could call this an independent phenomenon. This is why I like their use of the term e-trust, because e-trust separates, at least in our minds, um, trust in the everyday sense from, from trust in an AI. And there are common sense ways in which you can bring out this distinction as well. For instance, there are certain trust exercises. When we think of trust, we tend to think of that, that exercise of falling back and your colleague catching you or failing to catch you. Um, with trust that a chair will support my weight. Okay, so I trust this chair that I'm sitting in now which will hold my weight. But I don't trust it in the same way that I would trust a colleague. And this is the important point, is that the, um, the distinction that we can separate, that we can have between these two notions is useful and can be used by us to help maintain that distinction between, you guessed it, tools and colleagues. I've just talked about trust exercises that we do with colleagues and trust in a tool, namely a chair, that will support my weight. So this goes straight back to Daniel Dennett's point that we need to have clear water between the notion of trust in a human everyday sense um, and, and the sense in which we use for colleagues and trust in um, a technical sense, perhaps when it comes to AI, which is more equivalent to trust in a tool. So this is an imperfect analogy I'm drawing between trust in chairs and so forth, but it is preferable to ignoring that inconsistency because the danger that comes about in ignoring that inconsistency is that we lead to a situation in which we might end up trusting machines mistakenly. So what I'm getting at here is that in managing AI, we need to um, apply the correct theoretical framework to understand that um, when with what we have to understand what humans are doing and how humans think and understand in order to understand how that's separate from AI. We also have to understand that AI is an extension of ourselves, that it is not a new agent, that it is not a colleague that we are working with, but it is a tool that some person has used. And therefore we need to accept responsibility if we are the ones managing that AI and make sure that we are acting ethically and in the right way. So. By recognising this kind of theoretical framework I've been talking about, we can A, appreciate what is and isn't relevant to making decisions about implementing AI. So we can avoid non-problems. And we can also really focus down on what are the actual problems, which we steer away from often, I suspect, because the problems are hard. Non-problems are easy, right? So you can solve the non-problem of how a car might make a decision using the trolley problem. But that's just it's just it's too easy a, a solution for a, a problem that is clearly profound and important about who holds the responsibility it's not the car it's the manufacturer of the car and this brings me to point b which is that we need to hold the right people accountable namely humans or should i say well sorry, or programmers who are of course humans um but the people managing ai the people overseeing ai the people developing ai these are the people who are accountable not the ai itself so please feel free to tweet me any questions on the back of this lecture. Um, I will try and respond to every question coming in or as many questions as I possibly can. Um, I hope you found the lecture useful. Um, for your reference, here are some of the references I, I referred to during the lecture. Um, uh, so uh, you might want to do some further reading on this because I appreciate I have gone through a lot of this very, very quickly. Anyway, I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Bye.